Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you so much. Maybe you're Vince Power or Chris Benito or Steve Iadarola or our brand new patron, Marco. Marco. I'm just saying, if your name's Polo, please become a new patron tomorrow. Mm. On this episode of DTNS, why Sony is charging $700 for a game console, plus the shocking news that Meta was using public postings for training its AI models in Australia, and one of the oldest autonomous vehicle companies will let people not just put groceries in their cars, but people. Oh my goodness. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 11th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah, Sarah Lane. In, in Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. That's why when you just look at me with that long look, you're Stara Lane. <laughs> Stara Lane. <laughs> I was like, Stara, Scara. I don't know Stara. what I am. Today. That's your Halloween persona. <laughs> that's, Stara Lane. that's your roller derby. I'm workshopping some Halloween stuff, okay? Yeah, Let yeah. Me no, live. Good. I like that. I actually yeah. like a, a roller derby persona for you as well. That's a good one. <laughs> All right, let's start with the quick hits. Google search results will now include direct links to the Internet Archive, providing historical context to the displayed links that you were already looking for. This means that you can view previous versions of a page that might have been recently updated, allowing you to see what has changed. The new partnership utilizes the Wayback Machine, which shows how a website or specific page appeared on earlier dates. Yeah, if you missed Google Cache... Really? <laughs> but anyway, if you did, this, this will fill in for it. Uh, French startup Mistral launched a new model named Pixtral 12B, which is capable of processing both images and text. This 12 billion parameter model is based on Mistral's existing text model, Nemo 12B. It can respond to your query about an image and even respond to a URL of the image, or the image can be encoded in Base64, a binary to text encoding format. Either way, uh, it will be able to tell you things about that image, maybe do captions, stuff like that. Pixtral 12B is available for free. You can get it on GitHub, they got a torrent link for it, or you can go download it from Hugging Face. It is rather large, 24 gigabytes, uh, so you make sure you have enough space for it, but it is released under the Apache 2.0 license, uh, which allows you for broader use and distribution if you want to make a product out of it. Dutch company NXP Semiconductors announced it's planning to invest over $1 billion into India. This move will double the company's research and development efforts in the country. They're joining the ranks of NVIDIA and AMD, who have also set up research and design centers in India. During the announcement, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, highlighted that India co contributes about 20% of the chip design talent in the country, and they're gearing up to build a workforce of 85,000 technicians, engineers, and R&D experts. Uh, public service message, Microsoft registration for Ignite 2024 in Chicago, November 19th through the 22nd, is open. There's even a pre-day on the 18th. Uh, this is the developer and IT pro event from Microsoft, kind of its WWDC or Google I.O. Uh, Microsoft says Satya Nadella will be there, kicking things off during the keynote, as usual. He'll be joined by Scott Guthrie, the EVP of Microsoft Cloud and AI, and Rajesh Jha, EVP of Experiences and Devices. Adobe says it will launch a new Adobe Firefly video model later this year, a video creation and editing generative model. The company says the tool can generate a five second clip for a single prompt and can also interpret both text and image prompts. I feel like, you know, all the companies are doing this these days. Uh, but this is Adobe, which also said it was trained on public domain and licensed content. Oh, that's true. Mistral didn't say what theirs was. During an Australian government inquiry into AI adoption, Meta's global privacy director, Melinda Claybaugh, re revealed that the company had been gathering data and continues to on Australians to train Meta's generative AI technology, and that goes back with data since 2007. Now, initially, Claybaugh 
denied that the company was doing this. This is according to ABC News, but then later acknowledged that Meta collects all public photos and texts from uh, Facebook and also Instagram posts by Australian users that are over the age of 18. Now, the posts have to be public. So if the posts are private, this is not an issue. But there's no alternative opt-out option available, which some folks in the EU would say, well, we have that. Australia does not. Um, neither does a lot of the world. It's not clear whether the company is also collecting data from users' accounts prior to them turning 18. But of note, Claybot did say that Meta doesn't scrape the accounts um, of those users under 18 but if those photos and information about those users end up on Aunt Martha's Facebook page, for example, that would be data that is collected. So, um, Scott, uh, are you outraged? No, um, I think that this is not that big a deal. Um, I Tom's going to go more into like the the ins and outs why it's not a big deal, but for me, why it's not a big deal is I feel like Aunt Martha and everybody else and their dog already understands this. If you don't understand this about the internet, even when they tell you about privacy, even when one of your favorite companies says, we're the most private ever, that's why you love us. We heard you, all that stuff. I, I don't, it's not that I don't believe it. I'm just skeptical to the point of like, if I'm going to put myself out there, I need to just acknowledge the idea that if my stuff's out there, it's out there. Regardless of how anyone promised me it would be okay. So whether there's a hack or whether there's a leak or whether there's malfeasance on the company side or any of that stuff, I am okay because I've already made this decision a long time ago that my stuff is out there and it will be out there. And as a parent who raised three kids, it was important for us to have our kids understand that choice, make that choice on their own. And when they did, you know, we'd keep an eye on it, that sort of thing, be good parents, good stewards around it. But at the end of the day, you're out. You're just out there, man. Yeah. The, the, there's nothing new in this story. I feel like the Australian government is trying to gin up a controversy for multiple reasons. Uh, maybe they want momentum to, to pass a new law, in which case, you know, maybe it's uh, you know, um, the, the means to a, what they consider a good end. Maybe it's just for getting reelected, uh, which is a little more cynical. But there's nothing new here. Uh, we, we knew <laughs> that Facebook was training its models on posts that are public. Uh, it's not new that they're like, oh, and those posts, if Aunt Martha has reposted uh, something posted by a child, that post is now on Aunt Martha's page. Like, okay, yeah, maybe that's a loophole that needs to be closed. Uh, the entire public internet has been trained by various models because we didn't have any rules about that. Because the no. existing rules were, well, if it's public, you can access it. Uh, so, so you know, not, not to go over old ground too much again, but remember, they're not storing your Facebook posts in a database somewhere so that they can spit them back out in a model. They are scanning them and looking for associations and creating associations and training their model to say, when we see these words near each other, uh, that means they are associated more right, often. Yeah. So when you're or trying like to predict what to say, a you birthday know, party with a dog in the photo. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They aren't putting your birthday party with your dog in the database. So, uh, uh, there's a lot less here than meets the eye. On the other hand, uh, also covering old ground, we know that now that people know what these models can do, people feel uneasy about their data that they otherwise didn't mind being public, being used by these models. I think that fear may be a little overblown, but I think it's fair to respect that right and say, hey, maybe we need new controls. That's why the EU has put in place their law. That's why Australia is probably trying to get up controversy to put in its own law. I hope that these laws take into account that you want to lit litigate with a light or legislate with a light touch uh, and say, give people control over their information. Don't give Facebook some kind of first mover, you know, uh, uh, incumbent advantage. Don't overdo it. Just say like, hey, everybody should have the right to say you can't use their data to train, even if it's otherwise public. Uh, and let it be that. that. That's where I'm at. I feel like the story, this isn't even, like you said, Tom, it's not even a story except that Australia can point to the EU and say, well, you're not doing that with their data. 
So, you know, <laughs> yeah. so what, so what, what's happening here? That's like, <laughs> like pointing at Japan and saying, well, you're not driving on the right on their roads. Like, yeah, <laughs> right. the rules are different. You want to change your rules, change your rules. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you think? Do you think it turns into that? Like that? Is that what they're trying to stink oh, yeah. up here? I do. Th- I do okay. think it's it's a movement towards that. And again, whether that's a cynical re-election ploy or whether they really want to create legislation, I I, I don't know. Mm. Uh, maybe it's both. Probably yeah. both. I yeah. do think that you know the 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 whole conversation here is all right, this is going to potentially scare people. Some people on Facebook aren't going to care anyway. Some people will. Okay, so for those that do care. What are we concerned about? What is this model going to provide that then makes you feel like something was taken from you? And uh, I don't know that answer. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't really, I, you know, I feel like if, if I've got public data out there, it's going to be scraped. That's just how it, how life works. And I also I, have options to either not share it at all or make certain things private. I think a lot of people see the headlines about, uh, you know, the New York Times was able to trick open AI into recreating one of its stories. That takes a lot of work. It's not going to just kick out a picture of your child and your dog at the drop of a hat. In fact, it's unlikely to be able to do that. So I think, but I think that's one of the things people worry about. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing people worry about is autonomous cars. Uh, Some people worry that they'll never be successful because they invested in a company that makes them. Other people worry about them you know, running them over or something. Uh, Nuro, N-U-R-O, was one of the first companies to put autonomous vehicles on the road back in 2018 in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's one of the only companies licensed in the United States to operate without a safety driver on public roads. That's because it doesn't even have space for a person in its vehicles. These are little buggies that have compartments that you can put groceries and other stuff in. They show up in front of your house. You go out, you punch in a code or scan a QR code or something. They open up, you pull out your groceries or whatever it is you're having delivered. Neuro has avoided the regulatory nightmare of trying to carry people around and proceeded quite well. However, autonomous vehicles aren't catching on as fast as people would like them. Neuro is facing some financial pressure. So I think that's probably behind the fact that Neuro now thinks its technology is good enough to license to operators who want to use it in a car that carries people around. Now, to be clear, Neuro is not going to make those cars. Neuro is saying, do you make a a vehicle that can carry people around and want to have an autonomous robo taxi? Are you a car maker who wants an advanced driver assist system that could almost drive itself? We're available. We would love to work with regulatory agencies to get our software approved to be used in your car. Let's make a deal. Yeah, I. uh, this is one of those things where it feels like every time you've got a story like this, it feels like we are finally making progress toward an autonomous future. Slowly. And uh, <laughs> in this particular case, though. Slowly but surely. Sh- slowly, yeah. Now, that's yeah. the one thing is I remember all the talk about by 2020, we'll all be, you know, like that kind of stuff never came to fruition. And then it became 2024. Oops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just keeps getting moved. Um, and I suspect it'll move even more. We're not done moving it. But um, I do like progress in this regard and as much as it's easy to get cynical about the state of things this is probably what we want we want it to go slow we want to be sure even though there's a lot of accidents every year and everyone talks about how safe autonomous cars are in in comparison i still think you know it's okay to take our time but it is nice to see some tangible results of all this work and research I mean, so as somebody who has seen Waymo cars, I mean, the the first time I saw one, uh, I lost my mind. And now, I mean, I see three of them every time I take more than a 10 minute walk outside. Um, It's it's happening. We're there. So if Neuro uh, is like, all right, we've got the technology. We feel pretty good about this technology and we want to partner with another company to you know, take a person from point A to point B, what is that company going to be? That's my question. Yeah. Well, auto manufacturers seem like a really good way to do this because then they can just be advanced driver assist systems, which are easier to pass regulatory scrutiny and more car companies would be willing to talk to them. Uh, I think Neuro is facing financial pressure, partly because this industry is not as successful as they had hoped uh, and not not making you know progress as fast as they would hope, but also because the big guys are shoving them out of the way. You know the the Chevys or the GMs and the uh, and and the the Waymos, 
uh, are, are kind of elbowing them out. So they're, they're looking around for other options to keep themselves in business. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, maybe they can get some Chinese companies that are looking for a leg up in the United States. I doubt they would want to start putting in a mainland China, but maybe outside of China. Um, there are probably some smaller autonomous car development companies that are looking for just this sort of thing. We'll see. Yeah. It feels like there's, you just, every other day, it feels like there's something about some car company who, Oh, our expectations haven't been met. We're scaling back or our EV division is going to close or our autonomous plans have changed. They've all been delayed. I still think the safe bet though, in the long term, are this, kind of the OEM method of mm -hmm. we provide amazing, essentially internal software internals, um, all the guts that you're going to need to make a proper autonomous vehicle GM and GM saying, well, yeah, we could spend, you know, 300 million R and D or more to do it ourselves. And I'm, they probably are anyway. I don't know, but I just, I feel like the future is a little like Microsoft and the PCs back in the day and, and still today with windows you're you're providing uh or even cloud services now you're providing kind of the guts of what makes this thing work and then let the expertise of that of the actual car manufacturing stay where that is best which is with ford with gm with nissan whoever it is and so i think again it's a, this slow road and it's painful and investors don't like it but i think it's all heading in that direction yeah and i i think neuro uh has a, a harder road <laughs> to keep using the road like metaphor it. on a car yeah. thing, uh, it has the harder road because they're small and independent. You know, I mentioned Alphabet and Waymo. I mentioned Cruise, General Motors thing, but but Amazon also has their own Zooks out there. So Neuro is one of the few successful, or at least one of the most successful indies out there. And that gives them some flexibility because they aren't part of these larger organizations. Well, and you just have a lot of ride data, you know, for not for uh, transporting humans, but but successfully making ma making making the thing go to the place yeah. <laughs> and then coming back, to, yeah. <laughs> coming back to the original place i also think that we're this feels this whole thing feels like and i i'm pretty bullish about it but it feels like we're stuck in that mode of so it's a car with a drive you know we gotta we uh, you know the um there's no human driving it, but it looks like a car. And then you've got passengers in the back and we've kind of reimagined some of that stuff, but we're still in the early days of, yeah, it's a car that no one's driving. And I think that the <laughs> autonomous, the autonomous car that no one's driving, once it becomes a thing that is more widely accepted, isn't going to look like what we're doing right now, which I think holds a lot of people up. Well, think yeah. about it like elevators. That's how it'll be. No more attendance. You just get in there, push a button, and you're off. Yeah. You know what I mean? That must I have been sense. weird. Some generation thought that was weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The first. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that they, they're like, wait, there's no one in here operating this thing. Yeah. But yeah, they're they're fully autonomous. That's autonomous really planes. Yeah. Who's ready? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> They are basically autonomous. Like kind of, I've, I've yeah. had multiple pilots write in whenever we have this conversation. Of like, people overestimate what the autopilot can do. You need the pilot there, but there's a no, lot that it does that yeah. people don't realize that it does. Sure. Uh, well, some of those pilots are in our Discord. If you'd like to talk to them and ask questions, or maybe those pilots would like to sound off in our Discord, you can join our conversation at patreoncom DTNS. Just link your Discord account. Sony revealed the PlayStation 5 Pro yesterday, Tuesday. The Pro has a larger GPU that supports advanced ray tracing and AI-powered upscaling and speeds up graphics, rendering uh, by about 45%. Sounds good. Goes on sale November 7th for $700 US dollars, and an optical drive uh, it, disc drive is sold separately for $80. Uh, that was something that a lot of people noticed um, at first, like, what about the drive? So yeah, that would be uh, an additional $80. So $780 for both. Scott, what do you think uh, the upgrades mean for gamers? And are you excited? One one quick thing to, to clear up about this thing too. There was a lot of talk about how this seemed to be a digital only device and they are selling it kind of digital only facing forward. But um, the good news is, uh, according to Sony, uh, and this was after a lot of speculation and people reaching out to them, they confirmed that the 
the disc add-on that is currently available for the Slim, I think it is, uh, is also compatible with this device. It will cost Oh, more so money, if you already have it, then yeah. you don't have to spend it. If you already have it, you could keep it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You just move it to that device yeah, yeah. if you wanted to. Um, but overall, I'm actually going to tell people that I don't think this is a good value. And the reason I'll say that is uh, there's some caveats to that. Um, the the mid-cycle bump that we're seeing, and we saw it with PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 4 Pro. Uh, at the time, Microsoft also was in this party, and they did a uh, Xbox One Series X or whatever the heck they called it. Xbox One X is what they called it. And it was an experiment in, in a lot of ways because up to this point, no consoles had really done this. They, there's always like a slim or a smaller version or a more uh, uh, less expensive often, but uh, you know a version that's a little more down the road. This is about when we would see one of these. Sony has opted to do this again. Microsoft shows no plans of this. So they're kind of doing this without any competition. And I think that's part of what makes them feel like they can go $700 on this thing. Um, these devices have often been positioned as lost leaders in the past, uh, almost always. Uh, Nintendo's a very rare exception. They usually don't lose money on their hardware. If they break even sometimes, but it's pretty pretty dang close. Um, losing money on the console is something Sony and Microsoft are used to doing for at least a portion of the life cycle. This is them saying, yeah, we don't want to do that anymore. We're going to charge $700. And for those of us who've spent $1,500 or more dollars on a GPU for a computer... 700 bucks may not sound like that much money, but I'm not sure you're getting the boost you think you might be getting, even though this chip is a better chip, it's a faster chip, better CPU, more compute cycles. All these things are important. Uh, their AI technology that's a lot like DLSS and uh, FSS or FS, I forget the name of AMDs now. Anyway. R. Uh, is it FSR? It is, yes. Thank you for the R. <laughs> uh, it's, it's starting to get confusing because they're all using these different terms. But uh, this this AI-driven PSSR, they're calling it, is interesting. Increased detail, more frames per second. It's um, Think about what motion smoothing does for your TV at Costco. I hate that, but it's it's similar. It fills in frames. Uh, where there are none and gives you a smoother, more which is good for experience. sports. So imagine it with sports where you would want it, not in a movie where you don't. Yeah, and especially games, high frame rate in games is yeah. where you want to be all the time. So I think gamers are all on board with that. Um, but having seen some side by sides on what this is going to look like, it is very hard to tell the difference. If you're already running a 120 hertz game uh, at 1080p and it looks great on your PlayStation 5, you're not going to get that much more advanced in this direction. Um, the base PS5 claimed great 8K performance, but never really did anything. There was no mm -hmm. content that really did any of that. Uh, this one is also claiming that. Um, so I will see, your, your, your mileage may vary. Um, aside from that, I think that if you're, let's say you're somebody who held off, you're like, I know they're doing a mid-cycle bump, so I'm gonna wait for that. Cool, this might actually be the thing for you. If that money doesn't seem too high for just buying a console in general, then this would, of course, be the best PlayStation 5 on the market to buy. No question about that. Um, but that price is kind of an issue. And if that's either the price is sticking with you and making you hesitate, or you've already got a PlayStation and you're just looking to spend a little more, I just get the Slim. Buy the Slim. Plenty of games work on it. Here's another really important thing, and this is a lesson we learned with that mid-cycle bump. It's also true generation to generation, but these companies, both first party and third party developers, they develop and gear these games and and uh, optimize optimize them for the biggest possible market share. Yeah, well, who yeah. is that? That's existing PlayStation Five, and in many cases, PlayStation Four owners. PlayStation Four still vastly more consoles out there than there are PlayStation Fives, and they still want to service that market. So, what what does that mean? The benefits and the extra power on the Five Pro are not necessarily going to be in every game you get or even any game you already have because they have to shoot for the, at least the middle, if not the majority of where things are, you know, where people have bought their devices. So it's, it's easy to go, ooh, I'm going to be able to bump everything up. It doesn't work that way in consoles, not necessarily. Um, all of that being said, it's really nice hardware. Like, yeah. It might even be worth seven hundred dollars in terms of hardware. But what, in a market, what about the idea of this. upgrading it, uh, like trading in your PS5, which uh, Mike Ibarra, for former Blizzard guy, pointed out? Like you can probably get about three hundred fifty bucks for a current P for an old PS5. Then it's only three hundred fifty bucks for the PS Pro. Sure. Is, I don't. 
I don't know if you're, I, it feels like you're arguing like it's still probably not worth it. You might want to just keep your existing PS4. Yeah, I just don't know that you're, the boost, I can almost promise you whatever boost you think you're getting will not be as evident to you as you hope it will. And even though we get a little bit of, uh, we get blinders on when we spend a bunch of money on some tech and then we run a root mm-hmm. for it and we want to see yeah. all the advantages for a while there, you're going to go, oh, it just feels faster, but you're not really going to, going to see that. I mean, some of the things that are going to perform better, um, are a increasingly sluggish menu system on the device. This is true of the series X as well. They just get worse over time. I don't know why this is, but they just get more overhead. I don't know what the deal is. It's not like it's a poor performer right now, but it's sometimes sluggish. That will probably improve. Um, and and you will see there will be a couple of games where you'll go, ooh, I can tell that the volumetric fog in this looks better in 4K than it did on my previous model. If that's worth either a $350 trade-in or a $700 flat-out rebuy, great. But I think that's not the majority. That's of the gamers. price. That's the price you have to decide whether yeah. it's worth it for you. Yep. Um, I do think we'll look back at this as a pivot point where Sony decided that it can't just make all the money off selling you the games. It's got to make some money off the hardware and it's going to treat it like a GPU upgrade. Uh, and that this is the point we're going to say, oh, that's that's when the game console, you know, in com- the, the game console marketplace took a turn. I, yeah. I think this this might be that point. Yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Peter in Brampton, Ontario. Hi, Peter. Peter says, in the talk about an AI singer in GDI 4851 on Tuesday, you talked about how an AI performer could do a concert. You could advertise it as real-time generated, so you might have a different sound night tonight depending on the temperature of the AI generation and how loose you wanted it to be. Oh, uh, yeah, that could be a benefit of like, oh, you want to follow this virtual artist around because you get a different experience every day. Yeah, because my point yesterday was, well, but I mean, do you get that sort of you never know what you're going to get from the artist, you know, in a in a in a live show experience. But but this would this would be at least some some type of <laughs> humanoid version of that. Yeah. There, there's always those little things uh, that happen. I mean, I was at a concert last night and uh, one of the members was playing rock, paper, scissors with with the person in the audience uh, for fun and almost missed their line. Right. You know, there's those little humanizing moments. There you wow. go. Thanks to you, Scott Johnson, because you are human through and through and we appreciate you for that. I'm yeah. more human than human, I mean, as the song goes, you know? If you're, if you're not human, you are playing it very cool. I'm right doing now. a really good Android thing. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I got good news for everybody because uh, you, you, everyone knows I love video games. They know I cover a lot of that stuff and how it ties to tech here on the show. Well, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, X blizzard uh, wonderkind Greg Street and I do a monthly show called Word on the Street. And the reason we do that is they've got a game under development and they want to be transparent about what it takes to make a big MMO in 2024 with kind of limited staff. Like they're not a huge studio, but they've got big ideas. And we have that show once a month. It actually airs this coming Tuesday. So I want to put people onto it who haven't heard of it. Maybe you might find it interesting. That's over at frogpants.com slash street, or just look for Word on the Street wherever you get your shows. Patrons, you are going to want to stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk politics, kind of. Is the Taylor Swift deep fake presidential endorsement story a tech story? That's going to kick off the conversation on the extended show. Stick around. You can catch our show, DTNS, is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're going to be back doing it all again tomorrow. Probably not with politics, though, but you never know. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)